Okay, hi, uh, my name is Jordan Plunner. I'm the product manager of artificial intelligence at Intel in our data center group. So I'm gonna talk mostly about AI in the data center. Obviously AI will eventually be in all aspects of compute uh, that we do, um, so, but today's talk will mostly focus on data center. Um, the, uh, the focus of my talk today is not so much just going on and on about our products from Intel, but actually kind of giving you some feedback on what we are hearing as we go out and talk to you know, literally hundreds of customers, everyone from cloud service providers who have been doing you know, AI and deep learning for uh, five plus years to customers that are just starting. There's a lot of confusion about deep learning and AI. Clearly, we're in the hype cycle. And so I hope today I could demystify it a little bit for you. It's hard to talk to sort of uh, everyone at once because everyone's sort of in a different stage of their life cycle of adopting AI. So some of you might not even started anything. Some of you may be at it from a cloud service provider and you may be five years into your journey. So there's obviously a large diversity when you look at cloud and enterprise and HPC segments. Um, I will talk about our products a little bit as we get you know, to the second half. Um, also, ask questions. I, I don't really have that many slides. They're not that technically dense. Um, so I'm actually happy to talk as well uh, about this. Um, one thing that we like to start off with is just kind of setting the context. Despite all the hype, and this is probably common for any hype cycle, is as we've gone out and done research, um, the overwhelming majority of people have not uh, started doing anything called AI. And I would venture to guess if you ask the 12% of people who said, yes, I am doing AI, they're not even sure what that means. Or it's the CIO who assumes his division or his company is doing AI, but doesn't actually know either. He just sent an email six months earlier and said, do AI, uh, because I heard about it at a conference. And, and so uh, if you are worried that you're behind, it's OK, everyone's behind. All right? Because I think people like Google and Facebook and Microsoft and even the Ubers of the world have really set this rapid pace for their own business about their adoption of AI and deep learning. And it's making a lot of people feel uneasy and nervous that you're really far behind. But the tools and the maturity of the products and the libraries and the software ecosystem is just now emerging for the broad market. The cloud service providers, who I will mention frequently as sort of the, the north star of where this whole market is heading, they have invested a lot of effort and money to kind of manually make everything work for themselves. And an interesting um, observation that we've had as we've gone out and talked more and more to enterprises and end customers is how different their problems are than a cloud service provider problem. Most of them are not trying to do translation from Chinese to English. That's not a general purpose sort of enterprise problem uh, or HPC problem. Most of them are not trying to tell the difference between a cat and a dog, right? Uh, most of them have real serious business problems, uh, ongoing business decisions they're trying to make, and they see how deep learning could be used to make those business decisions, but don't necessarily find that all the stuff that's being open sourced in of itself is the solution. They still need to kind of manually create a solution inside. Um, there's two chairs here, two here, a few onesies. People want to come on in. Okay, so I think th that's self-explanatory. The other thing that we come across, um, and this is depending on whether you're an end customer or you're a technology or service provider, is to help you talk to your customers or to your own businesses about where you want to go with AI. The first top of the slide um, is a term that's often used called narrow AI. I have a robot and all I want to do is add artificial intelligence to that robot and the solution I build is purpose built for that. Then what happens when the next division comes to you, whether again, whether you're a data center manager or you're a sort of provider of some kind, um, and they say, oh, I want something like that too, but for a completely different use case. Well, if you've kind of purpose built this entire solution just for that one use case, all you've done is a very narrow AI solution and doesn't scale. And if we think about IT, one of the key vectors of IT is how do I scale this? How do I do general purpose infrastructure and services that can be reused by different divisions, many of which don't tell me what they need a year or two ahead of time. They tell me they need something now, right? If you think about virtualization, this was the main goal of virtualization was how do we get servers into people's hands when they need it and not, and not have, to have them have to order you know, servers six months uh, ahead of time. 
Uh, so we really, as an industry, want to move away from this narrow AI. And a lot of what you hear about and read about, a lot of the amazing breakthroughs that you might read about are really narrow AI, and they're not scalable. It's a great way to do a POC, though. It's a great way to show your CIO or your partner what AI could do. Right? A lot of enterprises, a lot of people are still skeptical. So that's really more of like a POC approach. What is the ultimate goal? Um, the ultimate goal is that most businesses have some aspect of planning, production, promotion, and providing to customers. Almost every business can kind of fit into these four kind of life cycle buckets. And the real goal is, first of all, you want to separate the data scientists from the IT infrastructure. Today, a lot of these POCs are being driven by data scientists, and they're going and getting the, the hardware, and they're going to build this whole solution, again, for a very na narrow AI solution. The first goal is for IT to kind of step away and disaggregate the data scientists from the infrastructure, and for production operations to provide all the data pipelining, all the uh, data workflow, all the logging and monitoring features that integrate with the larger data center, and do all the lifecycle management, right? We want to kind of bring kind of total cost of ownership and, and OpEx and CapEx to deep learning. This is where we want to get to. I'll talk about how long that might take. Um, but this is why we don't want data scientists running deep learning from a total solution level, right? And then the next thing that IT wants to do is then figure out what are these technical services that you want to provide, right? The use case is really not image classification or language translation. That's just some kind of capability or functionality that sits below the application, that various applications in your data center can call to these services, right, and use those services, and ideally, these technical services or technical deep learning services might be used by multiple divisions within a company. And again, not kind of purpose built, but it's kind of strong or broad AI. Obviously, the smaller the company, the, the maybe the less ambitious you need to be. But for very large companies, you do need to think about, OK, I have a lead division or line of business that's saying they need X. I wonder what the rest of the company will need in the next two to four years. And how do I sit back and say, there's a smarter way to do this so that we can scale? Okay. Um, and I'll just say, uh, as I said at the very beginning, this was sort of not, and, and for those of you who maybe uh, came in later, I'm from Intel, this is not sort of our positioning. This was what we learned as we went out and talked to dozens and dozens of customers, right? So I'm kind of reflecting back to you kind of a lot of market knowledge. So I hope you find that helpful. Um, and, and to continue this conversation and get to more detail, here's an example of a POC that we did. So we have some data scientists on our staff, and we went out, we're doing many POCs of customers. The main reason why we do POCs directly as Intel, because we're a chip company, is because we actually want to learn as well, right? We have our customers, and we want to be able to sure, be sure that we can educate them on how they can best use our products. So in this case, uh, we were doing a um, kind of inferencing. We were training a model, and then obviously inferencing uh, on defect detection. OK, I'm going to be step up here. Probably a little easier to point. And if you think about what people talk about deep learning, one of the things they talk about most is training, right? Using massive amounts of data and training, multiple uh, iterations of a model, to get to a state of art accuracy, and then go deploy that model into production, which is typically called inferencing. But if you look at this POC that we did, when we walked into this customer, it turns out we had to spend months just doing data ingestion. First question we asked is, where's your data? Uh, well, we're doing defect detection, so it's on equipment outside the data center. Now we need to bring all this data that's sort of being stored, or not even being stored at all. Now we need to bring that into, data, into the data center. And I won't go through all these boxes, but I guess the main point is that it turns out that uh, just to do a simple POC on deep learning took us six plus months with the customer before we could even start training a model, right? Because after we pulled in all the data and stored the data, now you have to do feature engineering, which is what is that feature that you want to look for in the image? In this case, it was video. And now you have to extract that feature out of the video so that you can actually train on it, OK? This, is, by the way, is a great, a great example of where, say, a lot of the stuff that the cloud service providers are doing don't really scale to these kinds of problems because this is defect detection on a particular kind of equipment and this customer needs to kind of figure all this out on their own. There's no common data set out there for this person to work with to even build a, a prototype of a model. They need to build, a, build their first model on their data set. Um, and then, of course, the goal is not to train a model. 
the goal is to do the inferencing or the real world analysis of what are we looking at, where are the defects, right? And then actually integrate that into your service layer. So even though you want to inference on something, now you need to integrate that with your existing infrastructure to determine, well, what do I do with that information? Good, bad, defects, uh, or you know, not a defect, a defect. Now I need to make some kind of decision. And the learning that we had, because I'm in an AI group, and actually I'm really interested in helping Intel sell chips and nodes to do training. The thing that we learned is that the part that does the training, uh, I know this, oh, it's right here, right? It's 16 nodes, but it took us like over 160 nodes to put this entire infrastructure in place, all right? So it turns out that a deep learning problem looks just like a data analytics problem. Pipelining your data, your workflow, your storage, your initial storage, your, your, then you have to modify your data, then you have to do your next storage. You have to keep track of your models and put them in a model library so people can reuse those models over time. You have to know how to track your models because your data might drift. So how do you know if your state of accuracy is, con is consistent over time? And so when we, we now engage with customers, we actually show them this slide. And we say, you want to do a POC? It's not two weeks, it's six months. Maybe. Maybe. Um, there was a podcast I listened to recently about Walmart. Same exact problem. Where was Walmart's data? In their stores, right? But their online data was in their data center, right, for their uh, e-commerce website. And they wanted to do training on all this data. It took them a year just to bring, bring their data together, OK? So uh, uh, you know, this is a learning that we did. I think it's being talked about more commonly now. So um, as we like to say, you know, deep learning is not just about training. It's just about analytics. For customers that have already done things like data pools or data lakes and have an analytics infrastructure, then this is just really an evolution off of that, right? We don't want to see you all and you all advise your customers to go put in dedicated deep learning isolated infrastructure, all right? Now, because the data is so compute, uh, uh, memory intensive and compute intensive and storage intensive, you have to expand your infrastructure, right? This is unstructured, typically you know, image data or, or video, for example, which might need a lot of storage. But it should just be exp extension, expansion of your current storage infrastructure. And same on the compute. Again, if you have any questions, please ask. OK? Um, so this kind of takes that last thing that we just did. Um, and kind of blows it out. So when we did this POC, right, we had, I already told you in the past slide, we labeled the data, we loaded it, we did the sort of augmenting the data to isolate the feature we wanted to, to train on, and then we did the training. And we found that training, that for training, about 30% of the time across various POCs were spent just on training. So also a lot of emphasis or time uh, or discussion is spent on how fast can I train? You can see if you, if you speed up your training per se, it might be interesting, but it's not going to really speed up your time to solution, right? Um, and then, of course, this is just a development cycle. We need to source the data. We need to do the inferencing. And then we need to figure out how do we integrate that inferencing results with the broader application. And um, you can see here that this bottom section just looks like any analytics presentation you might get from a Gartner, right? Which is, you know, I need to get my data, I need to integrate it, I need to process it. And AI is just kind of another step in that evolution, right? Uh, some people are now starting to create slides where they just show deep learning is just another step in the evolution of, you know, Hadoop and Spark and setting up data lakes. That deep learning is just the next step to, uh, along that, that uh, sort of maturity path. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Intel now, um, uh, transition. So what, what is Intel doing in this space? Well, one key message is that as we talk to all the divisions inside of Intel and customers across the spectrum, really, if it computes and it's connected, it will do AI eventually, right? Any application you have could theoretically do some level of artificial intelligence. Uh, which we normally define as deep learning, but often people put machine learning, classical machine learning inside that a bucket of AI as well. And what we find is that there'll be a need for what we call just general purpose CPUs, right, that either do training or inferencing, right? Who would use general purpose CPUs for these types of things? People who are not doing year-round consistent training and inferencing, right? The people that do the most intense inferencing and training 
are cloud service providers today and people who are doing appliances. These are people, companies that are usually four or five years down the road having trained models, having deployed models into a data center, and they're just now kind of really coming up against a wall where they're doing so much of this that they want to start offloading it to kind of purpose-built accelerators. And that's for the data center. So for, for the data center, right, we all obviously have people using GPGPUs to do speed up their training at scale. And uh, as Intel's already announced, we have a neural net processor that we are developing, which is the world's first purpose-built processor just for training. Okay, and we are going to be sampling that this year. Um, and then for inferencing, you find that people will either mostly use mainstream Xeon processors, mainly because the application is the one that's doing the inferencing. So it's best to just have your inferencing integrated with your application as a low-level function uh, on, on the Xeon processor. But we do see that uh, for people who need very low latency, real-time inferencing, or very customized inferencing solutions, they often use FPGAs in the data center. A few customers do that. Um, and today we're not prepared to be announcing anything, but we also do see customers really starting to ramp up the inferencing they're doing in data centers, and we're you know, exploring doing an inferencing accelerator into the future, but we're not announcing anything today. Okay? Um, when we go outside the data center, what we, all, we see something very similar. We see general purpose CPUs needing to do some low levels of inferencing, right, in the real world, okay? Um, you can think of um, a, a, a desktop or a client doing some biometric inferencing, right, on fingerprints or faces. But you wouldn't want to use a special purpose accelerator for that. But we do see as we go out closer to the edge, and these are uh, companies that Intel has mostly acquired. Uh, Movidius does vision processes for cameras. Mobileye does um, uh, inferencing uh, and other, uh, other functionality inside of an auto autonomous driving vehicle. We have a speech IP for like always on cameras, uh, 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 smart speakers. You see that on the edge, you will start seeing purpose-built devices for very efficient, uh, low power inferencing. Typically devices that are, are purpose-built that are doing inferencing all the time. So the main point to take away from here, and by the way, Intel has other products that I didn't even bother putting on in here because Intel spans sort of this huge ecosystem from 100 milliwatts to 400 watts from the edge to the data center. Uh, the main point is that as you start thinking about deep learning in general, realize that the answer of what should I use is not an easy one, right? It's going to be very complex and very use case driven. Many people will be happy and satisfied with general purpose processors, and others will need purpose-built products. And they all have their place. And we see the same thing among our competitors, meaning the ARM ecosystem and the other ecosystems that are out there will be doing the same thing, trying to figure out what level of deep learning capability to put in their devices. So taking some of these points together, um, this is a very technical slide that we have drawn. Um, which kind of shows how we look at our customers, especially those that are just starting their deep learning uh, work, right? And what their journey would probably look like realistically, right? So uh, we see that we spend about six to 12 months just doing a POC with a customer, just getting them up and running to learn uh, what deep learning can do for them, usually specific to a, a use case. And then it takes another six to 12 months to integrate that, those deep learning capabilities into their production workflow. As I already mentioned, no one's greenfield. Everyone has an existing IT environment. And the goal is, how do I integrate this into the production environment of monitoring, orchestration, uh, resource allocation, service allocation, uh, access to my storage? It, um, like I said, it could take six to 12 months. And then what we see is that as people start running, um, we see this with customers that are further along on this path. They start doing a lot of inferencing, right, which is this deep learning stage where you're recognizing images or speech or doing translation. And that, that kind of begets more deep learning. It's kind of a, a, a circle, a virtuous circle. And then at some point deep into the future, right, two, three years forward, then we start having conversations with customers about whether they need to do things like acceleration and offload. Right? So our recommendation to our customers is start with general purpose processors. Everyone has them. You can start tomorrow. And then only down the road do you find the need to then think about purpose-built accelerators. Because purpose-built accelerators kind of have a trade-off. Um, so where are we with Xeon today? 
Um, so we're working very hard to, mar to democratize uh, deep learning. So we launched our Skylake processor this last year, uh, 2017. And one of the things we did is um, we made a massive effort to actually enable deep learning and integrate that with our processor. And there are two things that we did. One is that um, we added, uh, we enabled some of the hardware capabilities that are in uh, the Skylake processor. That's the one that's in production now. Uh, one of the key features is AVX 512, which is a feature that helps you parallelize processing on an Intel CPU. Turns out that deep learning is simply a parallel processing problem. And you can solve that on a purpose-built processor with lots of small cores, which effectively is what uh, NVIDIA has done with the GPGPU. But you could also solve this on a general purpose CPU using things like AVX 512. That's what it was built for. So with the additional cores and threads, the more memory channels, the larger cache, and AVX 512, we've been able to deliver a, a pretty massive speed up of deep learning performance on Intel CPUs. The other thing that we did was we uh, learned that the software that is delivered in the deep learning community is not optimized for IA. It's actually optimized mostly for GPGPUs, okay? And the company that's responsible for optimizing all this software for Intel architecture was Intel, and we were a little behind in that. So a lot of the perception that you can't do deep learning on Xeon was actually created by the fact that the out-of-box experience on Xeon was really poor. Okay, and that's, not, that's no longer the case. We've now optimized TensorFlow, CAFE, and the, some of the other frameworks where uh, as you go up and get the uh, containerized uh, TensorFlow solutions or a Python solution or a Spark solution with something that we call Big DL, which allows you to do deep learning on top of uh, Spark and Hadoop, um, you can get an out-of-the-box experience of just running deep learning on Xeon, both for, no, both for multi-node training as well as inferencing, okay? So this is the thing that we're advising our, um, our customers to do is to start with Xeon because everyone has Xeon and most people prefer TensorFlow. So in the broad community, TensorFlow is by far the most popular framework. Some of the CSPs have chosen other frameworks to, uh, to optimize around. And we've said, hey, start with TensorFlow. You can take a, um, a Docker container of TensorFlow. And it has our libraries integrated into it. Uh, that optimize the low-level kernels for Intel architecture, and you can just run it, and your developers can be up and running doing training across multi-node Xeon you know, in a matter of days. Right? This is a real big change. We've just started talking about it because the enabling has taken us probably about six months to go make all the changes and all the low-level kernels for IA. Um, any questions about that? Yeah, go ahead, ma'am. So, um, uh, related to this training, yeah. uh, give a model, and I assume it's very manual in the sense of the training. You need someone to really look at it to figure out what's in this, what's working, what's not. Right. And then from there, you, you basically you know, um, expand your model. Right, there's no magic uh, kind of right. automation of training. It's really a human training of picking yeah. things that fall out, and then Yeah, the question is how manual or automated is training, and a lot of it depends on how common or new of a, of a use case you have. Yeah. Because in things like TensorFlow, so much is being open sourced by other people, models are being put into TensorFlow that are there for you. People who've trained models with certain kinds of data sets let people know what are the hyperparameters they set. Uh, and the batch sizes they use. So you can, as a data scientist, look at see what other people have done, and you might be able to get to train something very quickly. Yeah. Because your problem may not actually truly be that new or different, right? Um, and we see this, of course, more in the enterprise, as they're, tra they're doing stuff now that has already been done by cloud service providers. So a lot of, a lot of the uh, use cases have already been matured sort of in TensorFlow. But yes, if you are doing something new, new kinds of data sets, um, you might have to do a very manual training process, do lots of iterations, uh, really try to figure out what are the right features and hyperparameters that you need to use to get to state-of-the-art accuracy. Um, yeah, so in summary, um, you know, there's a lot of detail on this slide, and I guess the main point is we don't want you to care about the detail. 
right? We have low-level libraries like Math Kernel Library for neural nets, but the idea is that as you download the frameworks or, or containers that we make available, all this code is just there and it just runs for your data scientist. And so what we hope to do is to allow IT to just provide the Xeon compute and storage to their customers and let's let them have this, their data scientists just focus on the software they need to download for that. Um, and to kind of set an example, to kind of give some a little bit more detail on where we are right now, um, this just kind of shows just through um, generational improvements going from our Broadwell CPU, which was two years ago, to Sky Lake and then showing performance improvements on Skylake in terms of software. Uh, in, this, in this use case, this is inferencing, uh, so this is images per second on CAFE ResNet 50 that we uh, just, on 32-bit, we're already doing 650 images per second on a Xeon. So of course you have to ask yourself, when it, when it comes to like the use case, how many customers need to be doing 650 images per second 24-7? That's a very, you know, um, it's a very great number. Accelerators can show even higher numbers, but the real question is what does the company need, right? And then as we go to the future, uh, most inferencing will be moving to 8-bit from 32-bit, um, and then we'll be, and that actually doubles your performance, and then when we get to our next CPU, we'll double our performance again. So we are on this trajectory of going from like 1,600 to 1,400 images per second with 8-bit, and more like 3,000 images per second when we release our next CPU in a year. So this is, where you could, this is what you can do on a Xeon today. Uh, that said, we do have customers that have been doing inferencing for three or four years, and their applications are really mature, and they're really pushing the boundary of what even Xeon can do, and they're looking at accelerators. But they're four years, five years down their path of really just even doing any inferencing at all. Let's see how we're doing on time. Two minutes, oh, okay. Um, actually, I'll just do one, one final point. Um, training is a multi-node problem or a multi-accelerator problem, right? You have very large models, lots of layers, lots of activations and weights. So the question about Xeon is not only per node performance, but it's also per scaling out performance. So this is a third party uh, uh, customer of, of Intel's who built an HPC cluster and they tested scaling training on Xeon from four to 256 nodes and they measured about a 90% scaling efficiency with our software, which just showed that as, as your training models grow and as fast as you want to train, you just keep adding more models. The thing I drew here is that when you go above uh, 32 nodes, you can train in a, in a day, right? So um, ResNet 50 has 1.2 million images, so this customer was able to train a model with 1.2 million images in a day on Xeon. And so that, uh, actually they did it in, in 70 minutes actually because they used 256 nodes uh, for their uh, training. So um, uh, that's more of an HPC example, but it gets the point across that um, going forward, our top recommendation is just to do multi-node training uh, for customers who want to um, start training their models. I got one minute, any questions? Okay, yes, and I'll, I'll hang out outside as well. So you mentioned the 8-bit uh, and the, how they're the Yes, there are. I mean, yes, so we have a roadmap. I think the, the, the trend has been to lower and lower bit. Uh, there'll be mixed precision as well, where you'll have, you know, four, two, uh, one, four, and one, two, and four bit along with eight bit, maybe even still with FP32 layers. <coughs> so I'm not sure they'll be inferencing only at lower precision, but it might be mixed precision, is my, my guess at this time. Thank you for your time.